Uh, hello ladies and gents, today I'm gonna tell another little prison story. First, about haircuts. Haircuts were a very particular thing in prison. They were quite heavily and obviously influenced by street culture. Often there was pride in having one's hair cut into a fade or having lines cut in. This could not be achieved under the watchful eye of the guards, so often this was achieved, again, illegally, in the dormitories. The process taking place to allow this was quite interesting, as it involved the acquisition of loose razor blades. This was not achieved easily or simply, as loose razor blades were illegal to possess while also being valuable as a self-defense weapon, further increasing that value. These blades were acquired several ways, of which I will disclose only one and the most commonly known technique. The razors were issued and recollected within about one hour three times a week. They were counted and checked at the gate to make sure, in theory, that they still contained the razor itself within the plastic housing. To make this easier, strips of fine metallic foil from the tops of cigarette packs or scraps of tin foil procured at a very low cost from kitchen staff were then inserted in place of the razor and closed. Now, the housing for these razor blades was also made of a clear plastic, in theory, again, to make this process harder. However, the guards were loath to obviously touch the razor blades themselves, and often, if it was discovered later that something had gone missing, the guards were, well, mum's the word, because they themselves don't want to admit to having been tricked, so they would largely ignore it. Armed now with this loose razor, one could open a barbershop. This was done by placing the razor in the teeth of a commissary comb, weaving it in, and even perhaps melting the plastic slightly. This was similar to the guard on an electric razor now, and it minimized nicks. The fee was high, depending on the skill of the barber, which was often displayed by calling people he had previously worked on over from various parts of the dorm. Capitalism was one of the roots of these human interactions, from what I can tell, and even in prison, I watched men cut hair for stamps and then send envelopes full of stamps home for their wives and kids. These stamps would, in turn, be resold on the street for cash at a small loss. Life's funny that way. I just got my hair cut when guards yelled at me and I got sent to the shitty normal barber. I didn't care about my hair in prison and frankly I was confused by people that did. That said, I did have one note. Black barbers were obsessed, and I do mean obsessed, with flattening out my widow's peak. They thought it was abhorrent and they desired nothing more than to give me some sort of a clean line up front. But. I also noted that occasionally when they did this to other people, all it did was look like they came back with a deeply receded hairline because, you know, you shave a little off here and then you have to make a correction over there and a hard pass on that. However, if you think that that process was inventive, uh, the number of tattoo artists of various skill I met on the inside was stunning. It seemed to me that on a long enough timeline, everyone in prison learns to at least rudimentally run ink. And the process for making a tattoo gun and hiding it was even more complex. First, you need a motor. By the time I entered the camps, motors were several generational hand-me-downs from previous commissary buys, although for between $75 and $100, one could still acquire an electric razor that could be used to make a new one. Often these were bought by customers and were the whole of the price of an agreed-upon piece of work. The real trick was knowing how to disassemble and reassemble this item from gun to razor and then back again, repeatedly, so it would not be confiscated for being modified. After this was in hand, it was a simple matter of acquiring a pen tube, needle, and ink. Ink was often manufactured by burning plastics and collecting the soot. Then one would combine this soot with an alcohol-based cleaning agent or shampoo. Colors were rare, but not impossible. I myself had let's just say, not an inmate, smuggle in some red for the tattoo on my left arm. Needles were made by buying someone's old empty lighter. Yes, people kept their empty lighters just for this industry. And the small spring, which was used to press the roller against the flint, was extracted, burned, and then very carefully unwound into a straight line. This tiny spike was then sharpened by hand against various grains of concrete and occasionally even sandpaper for days upon days until a fine point was achieved. This was commonly the responsibility of the receiver of the tattoo so that they could not complain about how the needles were handled or that the needles were too dull. Now these three items, needle, motor, and pen tube, were combined to form a makeshift tattoo gun. 
And as someone that has had them done in both manners, one with a real and one with a quote-unquote fake tattoo gun, there's almost no difference at all in the feel or function in the hands of a skilled tattoo artist. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised to learn that modern tattoo guns that one can buy that are industrially created were, indeed, created on a modified version of these tattoo guns. The act of getting a tattoo and the care afterwards is the real fun part. Some dorms were cool, which is to say some shifts of guards didn't seem to care at all. I remember once a tattoo artist getting caught just straight up with his gun in his hand by a youngish female guard. She just stood there and watched until he noticed he was busted. Then, he jumped and she laughed and said, what do I care? You're the one that's gonna get Hep C or HIV or something. Then she sat on a bunk and watched some more. That said, even then, if you lived in a bunk like that, you had to be careful, as fresh ink itself was something guards all over the compound would stop you for. And they'd put you in the box in hopes that maybe you'd rat on your tattoo artist. So they, the artists, would yell at you for having fresh ink visible. Uh, I often modified my clothing to make sure that my ink when it was done wasn't visible. That said, once, when my chest piece had just been finished, I seeped ink through both one of my t-shirts and a bedsheet when I was asleep. The artist, at no cost to me, paid one of the laundrymen to destroy all of this evidence for his own security. Never to get in trouble for that. I did cop a DR once. Uh, let me know if you want to hear what DR court is like in prison in the comments below. Well, that's all for me for now. Uh, I love all of you individually and as a collective. As usual, stay safe, good luck, and goodbye.